Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a series that aims to provide hope, an avenue for healing, and one that will help you understand and then live the great mercy of God. Uh, when we talk about the mercy of God, there's nothing greater than Jesus bringing himself to us in the Eucharist. And I've got two friends from Michigan, uh, Mark Zydak and Margie Nagel. Uh, I was blessed enough. They invited me up a few months ago to speak, and they're doing incredible work up in Michigan. And it's the kind of stuff I just hope and pray that it takes off all over the whole country like a fireball. Jesus said, I've come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it were already ablaze. We're going to talk about the real presence apostle of Michigan and how those in Michigan can get a hold of them. Or if, perhaps if you want to start something like this in your own state, uh, reach out to them. The website is rpamichigan.org. And uh, welcome, Mark and Marty, to today's show. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for having us. Y you know, it's so important we talk about this stuff because um, we're in a time of Eucharistic renewal in the church. Um, and unfortunately, I know it's a slow start. You know, the snowball's got to get bigger and bigger and roll down the hill here. But tell us about what's hopefully going to be happening in the church. And this renewal isn't just for priests and religious, is it? You're right, Dr. Thatcher. It's not just for priests and religious. It's for Catholics of all ages. And the National Eucharistic Revival is a three-year initiative sponsored by the bishops of the United States to inspire and prepare the people of God to be formed, converted, united, and sent out to a hungry and hurting world through a renewed encounter with Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, who is the source and summit of our faith. The revival was officially launched on Corpus Christi Sunday this year in June. And there's gonna be a milestone event in 2024 a National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis, Indiana. And the National Eucharistic Revival is a direct response to the Holy Father's call for a pastoral and missionary conversion, which cannot leave things as they presently are. And this is from Evangelii Gaudium, paragraph 25. The world needs our savior, especially right now. And we sometimes struggle with how to respond to all the needs in our world. We've wandered away from the source and summit of our faith. Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And this Eucharistic revival that the bishops have called for is a call back to the heart of our faith so that we can all be vessels of Christ in our families, in our communities, in our parishes. Now we faced a lot of problems in the world recently with scandals, division, disease with COVID and doubts. And the USCCB, the United States Catholic bishops, give a statistic that only 30% of Catholics believe in the real presence. And this is an incredibly low statistic, given that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith, the pinnacle of our faith, and that the mass is the pinnacle. And so the Holy Spirit is inviting the church for this time of healing and renewal and to return the church back to its apostolic roots to encounter and discover, rediscover Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. And the vision of the Eucharistic um, revival is to inspire a movement of Catholics all across the United States who are healed and formed and united by an encounter with Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, and then to be sent on mission for the life of the church. So the, the bishops are hoping for an enkindling of a living relationship with Jesus for every Catholic, whether they're young or young at heart. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about each year of the renewal and the revival. And the first year, which we're in right now, is the year of diocesan revival. And for this year, dioceses are encouraged to offer like days of formation, days of retreat or reflection centered on the Eucharist. And this will help the faithful grow in their knowledge and understanding and devotion to Christ in the Eucharist. And this is also complemented by online resources, which are available at this website, eucharisticrevival.org. And there you can find videos and other information about the Eucharist. Now the second year, starting in 2023, will be the year of parish revival. And this year, um, pastors will be invited to encourage um, Eucharistic, that their parishes become deeply Eucharistic communities through small groups, um, increased exploration, of the sacrifice of the mass, Eucharistic adoration, parish missions, maybe catechetical studies on the real presence of Jesus, and also events like Eucharistic processions, 
to help people in the parish more deeply encounter Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And this is an effort to help convert hearts and minds to fall more deeply in love with the Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Now this um, year, we'll have the milestone event. It'll be the first National Eucharistic Congress in 50 years. And the hope is that in July, 2024, 80 to 100,000 Catholics will gather in Indianapolis to worship the risen Lord in his humble disguise in the Eucharist. And we're praying that the Holy Spirit will enkindle a missionary fire in the hearts of the nation as everyone reconsecrates themselves to, to Jesus in the Eucharist. And the intended fruit will happen in year three. That'll be the year of missionary sending when the faithful from around the country who have attended the conference and perhaps people will be attending online as well, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll go forth as Eucharistic missionaries filled with the flame of divine charity for those around them. Now the Eucharistic revival is national in scale, but it's local in reach. Each one of us can close our eyes and think of a family member, a friend, a fellow parishioner or a neighbor who's wandered away from the faith, who no longer attends mass or believes in the real presence. And the revival is to equip each person to reach out to their loved ones, their friend, their fellow parishioner. And it seeks to make passionate disciples of everyday Catholics who know and love the peace that only comes from the Eucharist. So the revival is, is gonna be a concentrated effort to help Catholics rally together and lift up the Eucharist in our own hearts and then help our neighbors and friends um, to restore the Eucharist as the source and summit of our faith. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time, and, it's, and the whole goal of it is a transformation of hearts and minds to help people, especially encounter Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And there's some ways that people can become involved right now. If you go to that website, eucharisticrevival.org, you can um, sign up to uh, pray and fast and offer penance for the Eucharistic Revival. Also, there's a place there where you can um, offer your own testimony of how the Eucharist has transformed your life. So yes, everyone can be involved. Jesus needs each one of us to be his hands and his feet um, for this Eucharistic revival. Lay people, families, religious orders, priests can all volunteer their time, talents, and prayers to pursue this grassroots renewal that the world so desperately needs. And just as many humble, small pieces of glass come together to form a glorious stained glass window, each one of us, no matter how insignificant we think we are or imperfect we think we are, we can be Jesus's hands and feet for this renewal. And I don't know about you, but I'm hoping that a percentage of 30% will, over these three years, will become close to 100% that people really will believe in the real presence and will love Jesus in the Eucharist. You know, it was... Uh... 30 years ago when I fell in love with the message of divine mercy. And it was at that same time that a friend sent me a picture of a Eucharistic miracle from Batania, Venezuela. And that led me to read and soak up everything I could find on the Eucharist. And um, Mark, when I was up visiting you a few months ago, I sensed that same zeal of understanding of the real presence. You know, I look back in those 30 years and it was almost for me like there was an infusion of knowledge. It wasn't just about reading or something. It was, it was from God. And I, I understood, I, I really understood the Eucharist, the scripture. Um, and how did you and your wife, Sarah, get, get started in all this? Uh, well, I was teaching confirmation at the time, so trying to get kids to believe in the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And, and I was realizing really quickly that uh, we were getting nowhere. I mean, I, I remember doing a test one time and giving them four multiple choices and 25% got right what the Eucharist is. And I'm like, man, this is, I can't believe this, you know? And uh, at the same time, my wife, Sarah, was trying to get adoration started at our local church that we were attending at the time, Resurrection in Canton, with another fellow, uh, his name Emmanuel Semakula, who ended up with Margie and Sarah starting the Real Presence Apostle of Michigan. And they were having some resistance. And the reason they wanted to is because they were so in love with Jesus in the Eucharist. 
they want other people to be in love with Jesus in the Eucharist. And, and they thought at that time, adoration was the perfect way to have people get closer to Jesus and spend time with him. Um, so that's how we got started. And then all suddenly, I think Margot will tell you too, we started hearing about this thing called the real, the uh, Eucharistic Miracles exhibit. And uh, that really tweaked our interests. Especially once you start reading some of the miracles. I mean, it was just dovetailed so much into trying to start adoration. Because uh, once you realize who you're adoring, who you're spending your time with, that time is no longer uh, boring or something I have to do. You know, it's something you want to do. So that's how we got started. It's just uh, trying to just grow our own faith and trying to help others grow their faith at the same time. Um, and that led us to find out about Carlo and about the Eucharistic Miracles and things like that. Margie, you want to jump in with your thoughts? Um, yes. Um, the Real Presence Apostolate of Michigan kind of began with the inspiration when I learned about the Vatican exhibition of the Eucharistic Miracles of the World. And the exhibit, for anyone that doesn't know, consists of 120 panels, which are fairly large. They're two feet wide by two and a half feet tall. Each, and each panel represents, um, depicts a Eucharistic miracle, which has been approved. And there's 120 panels. And I first learned about the exhibit in 2006 from Cardinal Raymond Burke. At that time, he was Archbishop of St. Louis. And he had taken over some of Father John Hardin's apostolates. He was a holy priest and he lived for quite a while in the Archdiocese of Detroit. And he had started quite a few apostolates. One of them was the Real Presence Eucharistic Education and Adoration Association. And so um, when he passed away, um, our Cardinal Burke became the postulator for his cause for canonization. And Cardinal Burke became the spiritual director for all, a lot of his apostolates. So, um, one day um, in 2006, Cardinal Burke came to Detroit for a Father John Harden Remembrance Day, and he talked about the exhibit, and I was very um, interested, and I was able to talk to Cardinal Burke afterwards and ask him how I could bring this exhibit to Detroit, and he gave me the name of the association in Chicago, and he put me in touch with them, and I contacted them, and then um, several months later, they put me in touch with um, Sarah and Mark and Dr. Uh, Emanuel from Macola who wanted to bring the exhibit to Canton. So I asked them, would you guys meet me for lunch? And um, they didn't really even know what I was gonna talk about. And so when they, we met for lunch, I asked them, would you consider not just bringing the exhibit just to your parish, but would you consider working with me to bring it to the whole Archdiocese of Detroit? And they said, yes. And so from that day, the Real Presence of Apostolate of Michigan was born. And from that time, we had a, we had uh, raised the money to uh, print the exhibit because it is quite expensive to get it pr printed. But, but an anonymous donor angel came forward and helped us print the exhibit. And it began traveling in 2007 in June. And we got so many calls um, from around the state that we moved from uh, being just an apostolate for the Archdiocese of Detroit to being for the whole state of Michigan. And since that day, the exhibit has visited over 500 parishes in the state and all seven cathedrals. And so we were really hoping that um, it's, it was really busy traveling during this Lent, this past Lent. And we were hoping that, of course, with this three-year Eucharistic revival, it'd be traveling quite a bit. You know, uh, it's so fascinating because when I became on fire with Divine Mercy in the Eucharist, I began collecting artwork of Eucharistic miracles as well. And I had them beautifully framed. And uh, at the time we were shipping containers uh, of medical supplies overseas and we shipped a lot of containers over 25 years. But um, I, I was in communication with a bishop in India and he was building a Marian uh, shrine. And I said, well, you need a Eucharistic exhibit. So I shipped him, this was 25 years ago, all my Eucharistic miracles to India. And um, that bishop has since passed, but um, it, it brings up a question of blessed Carlos Acutis. Who, who was he? What did he do? What, what was his zeal and how did he become blessed? Well, Carlo is an unbelievably great story, especially for youth. I um, worked teaching life team for about 10 years and uh, Carlo is a perfect example 
for young people and for us alike. Um, he's an ordinary kid. This is the beautiful thing about Carlo. I mean, he died extraordinarily at the age of 15 from a blood disorder of all things. Isn't that ironic? This blessed uh, who promotes the Eucharist, but uh, he just had a love for Jesus, a love for Mary, a love for the Eucharist, a love for the rosary, a love for daily mass. And it just transformed his heart to where everything, which is, should be for all of us, everything about him became about serving God. And that's it. That's all he wanted to do. Um, if you're really interested in Carlo, it's a great book, Carlo Cutis, it's the first millennial saint, and uh, details a little bit about his life. I'd just like to share you just a couple of quotes from this, just so you might get to know Carlo a little bit too. So this is from Pope Francis in his address in uh, regards to Carlo Acutis. Carlo is well aware that the whole apparatus of communication, advertising, and social networking can be used to stupefy us, addict us to consumerism, and persuade us of the importance of having the latest gadget to be obsessed with our free time and to get caught up in negativity. Yet Carlo knew how to use communication technology to spread the gospel and the values of goodness and beauty. Carlo didn't fall into the usual trap. He saw that many young people wanting to be different really ended up being like everyone else, running after whatever those in power set before them with the mechanisms of consumerism distraction. Thus, they do not bring to fruition the gifts that God has given them. They fail to offer the world those unique personal talents that God has given to each. As a result, Carlo said, everyone is born original, but most end up dying photocopies. Don't let this happen to you. Wow. That's true. It's just a little bit of Carlo. You know, and Carlo, I think one of the things that is, especially with teens, as I would teach them as a, Carlo was so real. He, he played video games. He played soccer. He lived normal life. I think that's some of the things that maybe when we look at saints, we kind of like think, oh, they're so different than me. Carlo wasn't different than you and I in any way, except for he had a deep love for Jesus, and that permeated every single part of his life. Um, he started this exhibit when he started work on this exhibit when he was only 11 years old. Wow. He'd gone to a, a exhibit that was... Uh, something of the world, I think it was some sort of art exhibit in, uh, in Italy. And he saw these panels everywhere where they were displaying this art. And he's thinking like, how could we use something similar? And these people were lined up, you know, to view this. And Carlos thinking to himself, how could we use something like this? And why aren't people lined up to see Jesus? And that's when he started working on this exhibit. You know, working. I'm thinking of um, paraphrasing, um, Blessed Dina Belanger from France, that if people really understood the real presence, this was in the 1700s when he had castles and moats, and she said they'd be knocking down the doors of the church with the big ramparts they used to break into the castle, you know, and instead of the few at, at mass. Isn't that good? Carlo understood that. Can I add a little bit too about Carlo? Sure. Okay, so from his adolescence, he prayed the rosary daily, and he was devoted to other devotions to especially Eucharistic adoration. And he said, when we face the sun, we become tan, but when we place ourselves in the Eucharistic, in front of Eucharistic Jesus, we become saints. So well, this is a powerful testimony of how beneficial Eucharistic adoration can be. And he also said, the Eucharist is the highway to heaven. Wow. So, and he was really concerned with people growing distant from the church and leaving the sacraments, and he always tried to bring people back. In fact, he was the one that brought his parents to Mass. They weren't bringing him to Mass. He was encouraging them to go every day. So I think that um, his love for the Eucharist and for the Mass was just so contagious, and that's something that we all can learn from Carlo. You know, let's... Before we get into some of these Eucharistic miracles, which has fascinated me over the years and the people I've met and things, but okay, so somebody watching this and they say, hey, I want to find more about your group. What do you let's start at the beginning? What, what are you going to do? What are you going to help them? How are you going to help them? Uh, walk us through that, if you would. 
Well, you probably can't, I usually answer all the emails. So you probably contacted me and uh, really I'm just gonna direct you to where you can find more information first, uh, especially we just worked with um, the Archdiocese of Phoenix and I just got a call last week from the Archdiocese of Denver. So we're gonna start working with them too. Awesome. Um, this is gonna happen, but it's on God's time. You know, we're kind of impatient sometimes. I've been working with Phoenix for over a year and they finally have the, print, the panels printed in both Spanish and English. So um, I'm going to direct you probably to Carlo Acutis's website, carloacutis.org. And on Carlo Acutis's website, he has every Eucharistic miracle available to you in high definition. You could just go right to the printer and print them. They make beautiful artwork, by the way. So if you're out there, you say, I just want to have a miracle hanging around my house. Go to Carlo Acutis's website, pick out the miracle. You could take it right to your a uh, local printer, put it on poster board, and you can have a beautiful Eucharistic miracle in your in your house for a couple hundred dollars, you know? So, but uh, that's one place that you can go um, to find out all the miracles. Then I would just give you some coaching as to what you need to do. You know, do you need you need donors, you need to do this, and I, and I would help you along the way. That's what we did with Phoenix, that's what we're doing with Denver right now. Just give them coaching. And when someone uh, contacts us just to get the exhibit, we then send them all the information about the exhibit, what, all the miracles, uh, release agreement, um, where they have to pick it up, all that kind of stuff, announcements for their bulletin, who they need to get approval from, things like that. So, um, Are you hoping that in this three-year period, Michigan will kind of pick up the ball a little bit? I know you've said you've been in 500 already, but uh, Michigan's a big state, you know, and a lot of churches. Definitely, we hope that many um, parishes will have the exhibit, and if they ha have already had it, they can have it again. Um, sometimes parishes only take half the exhibit, depending on the amount of space they have. So some parishes will have half the exhibit one weekend, and then maybe several months later or the next year, they'll have the other half. But yes, we definitely hope that during these three years, it will travel a lot. Awesome. Wonderful. There's one other thing, Dr. Ryan. I mean, if... We we have funds, but uh, there's donors out there that like to make it happen. We'd love to give uh, the northern part of, the, of Michigan an exhibit. If they, can't, if, they have a, if they have a group of people that want to do this, they could do the same thing we're doing here. It has gone to northern Michigan, but not as frequently. It gen generally stays to stay in southwest and southeast Michigan because it's easier to get. It's located here. If there was one up there, it could definitely could travel more frequently up there, too. So if there's people up there, there they hear this and they say, wow. That's something I'd like to start. Uh, give us a contact and we'd, we'd help you out. You know, that's a very good point because I, I've been to the Upper Peninsula. I grew up just in Ohio, 90 miles from Detroit. And uh, it's, I think there are good Catholics that understand this and the need. And um, we have to evangelize. The evangelization isn't just for the priest. It's for the lay people. And it's time to pick it up here. And... Uh, Give your website again on how people can reach you if uh, they need more information or want to help. Yeah, it's real simple. RPA, Real Presence of Hospital, Michigan.org. Okay. R RPA, Michigan, right? Yeah. Michigan, the state and dot org. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, let's talk a little bit. As I said, I, I, you know, as a doctor and a scientist, I did a lot of research projects as a fellow and, um, I'm not one easily swayed by things you see or read. And, and uh, I was fascinated when I got into this stuff. And, and, and then, I, then I read, you know, legend had that Longinus, the centurion who pierced Jesus' heart was from Lanciano. Tell us about Lanciano. Well, I've had the good pleasure of being in Lanciano. Uh... It's way on the east side of, of Italy, in southern Italy, but a beautiful place. Um, this miracle is the one most requested. It's probably the most famous miracle. And the reason is it's because it's the most scientific miracle. Um, Lanciano, the short story is, a domestic priest was consecrating the Eucharist, and as he consecrated the Eucharist, he doubted. He knew his own sinfulness. He doubted that he could, through his hands, that this bread and wine could become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. 
And as he doubted, the host turned into a piece of flesh and the wine turned into blood. This is in the year of, it's right here, 750 AD that it happened. That flesh and that blood is still preserved to this day. It has some unbelievable characteristics. The blood, whenever you separate it, no matter how many times you separate it, it weighs the same. Scientifically really not possible, is it? The flesh is a flesh of a man of his heart. They sent this uh, tissue, a small sample, to New York. And in 1973, it was analyzed very thoroughly. And it found that it's a tissue of a man. It's his heart tissue. This man died under great distress. And that is still alive today. They can't explain it. Scientists in this regard has met its match when trying to understand this miracle that happened in Montana over almost 1300 years ago. Um, probably why it's the most requested. It, it is an amazing story, you know, but it's not just a story, it happened. And it's still there today. You could go see this monstrance and the chalice, it's still there right now. If you go to Lanciano, Italy, you can get that close, 10 feet away or so. You know, uh, I have to tell you, I, I've been there as well, but my favorite only because I met Dr. Gomez. Oh, yeah. Miracle in Buenos Aires. Would one of you like to share that one? Do you want me to? Go ahead. Okay. So Dr. Gomez is, is a great story in of himself because he is a scientist who is an atheist. And this miracle changed his view <laughs> of the world. As a matter of fact, He's about to write some books. We have a friend that's going to translate them from Spanish to English because he, he's Spanish. Um, but in Buenos Aires, as I, as I recall the story going, a host dropped down to the ground and um, wasn't consumable. So what you do in this case, even at, at my parish, what we do the same thing is you place it in water. So it will dissolve. And then you throw it into the ground. Well, this host didn't dissolve. It started bleeding. And this bleeding hose uh, they then brought in, who is now Pope Francis, the Cardinal Borgeo, in to, to view it and to make sure this is all authentic. And, and then they brought in a scientist. And that's where Dr. Gomez comes in. And he did the same similar scientific test as Lanciano. Matter of fact, I think it was sent to the same lab in New York to do the test. But his um, was even a little bit more shocking in the, like, the fact that when he tested it, what he couldn't figure out is the blood was still like it was fresh blood. It was like it, it still uh, beat. It was like it had, it had life in it. You, it could be used as fresh blood today. And as a scientist said, this is just not possible. When he first tested it, he did not know it was a, a consecrated host that had dropped down to the ground. Um, he was just doing a scientific test. And he was kind of like, well, where is this man? This man. How can, his, how can his blood still be beating? How can his flesh still be bleeding? Uh, this is impossible. And then they told him what happened. And eventually, he became Catholic after that. You, you know, Catholics, uh, you hear comments like, oh, the Catholics are making that up again. And, and uh, where's that in the Bible? Uh, let's talk a little bit about John 6. Uh, what does it say in the Bible? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Yeah, it's always been one of my favorite ones to teach on, um, especially to young people, because the apostles themselves, they weren't really keen on this. I mean, you see that they, they leave him at some point. Many of his followers, I mean, besides the 12, when Jesus would go out and speak, you'd have hundreds and hundreds of people following. We've been following him regularly. They'd seen the miracles. They'd seen everything he'd done. And when he starts to teach John 6 in his Bread of Life discourse, many of them leave. They, they find it hard to accept. So I guess um, it's always been one of my favorite ones to teach them. But also, I don't think we should be too hard on our brothers and sisters when they don't understand it or get it. Because even the people that follow Jesus didn't at that time get it right then immediately. Um, 
But it's a beautiful, it, it is my favorite of all the chapters in the Bible. It's probably my favorite and most Eucharistic. You know, to me, and further evidence is what you said, Dr. Gomez. I mean, here we have a scientist, like many scientists today, thinking of doing their research. They are all about science. I mean, I've interviewed people from MIT and religion is, is considered to be a joke from like, if you're spiritual, you're from like the 12th century. And it's only because science hasn't figured it out yet, but it will. And here you so have Dr. Gomez, a well-renowned scientist, and he converts. I mean, that speaks volumes to me. It, yeah. It, yeah. It should have. I was just going to mention too, that, um, all the uh, Lanciano example and Dr. Gomez example that he uh, studied, they're all type AB blood um, found to be of a man suffering. And this is the same blood type as the Shroud of Turin, which further gives evidence to, you know, the consistency of the miracles. And if people watching this show want to watch any of my earlier shows on the Shroud of Turin, I've got several incredible uh, interviews with um, scientist on the Shroud of Turin. Um, Margie, uh, do you want to add one or two of your favorite miracles? Uh? Sure. Um, one of my favorite miracles happened in Tumaco, Colombia, which and, and it happened on January 31st, 1906. Tumaco is a small uh, village on the Pacific coast um, on a small island in Colombia. And what happened that day was a undersea earthquake that lasted about 10 minutes. And the people were aware that there could be a tsunami and they were terrified and they ran to the parish church and they begged the priest to lead a procession with the Blessed Sacrament. And so the faithful priest, his name was Father Gerardo Lorando. He consumed the, the hosts that were in the ciborium. And then he set the big host, he put it into the monstrance and he said to the people, let us go, my people, let's go to the beach and may the Lord have pity on us. So the people formed a Eucharistic procession. They went down to the beach. They were crying. They were begging the Lord for mercy. And as they got to um, toward the beach, they saw this tremendous wall of water coming forward toward them. And the priest, he raised the monstrance and blessed the wave. And as he did it, this wall that was coming, 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 it stopped and it fell mm -hmm. back. And so the whole village was saved and the people cried, miracle, miracle. And they were, of course, overjoyed that the Lord saved their life, saved them. And um, this miracle was very well known at the time. So it just shows how the Lord, he could calm the wind and the waves and he, um, you know, in his life. And he continues to do that today. Another miracle I'd like to share about um, happened in, um, well, it's, it's in, I was able to view it in Cassia, Italy. It happened in 1330 and a priest um, was called to do a sick call. And he was called to bring the Eucharist to a sick person. And he kind of handled the Eucharist irreverently. Instead of putting a Eucharist into a pix, a small container and carrying the Eucharist close to his heart, he instead put it somewhat irreverently into his prayer book, into his breviary book. And when he got to the sick person's house and he opened his book to present, you know, and give them the person the Eucharist, he was startled to see that the host had started to bleed and there was blood all over his breviary. And he immediately was penitent. He ran to, um, to a holy priest named Father Simon Fadati and, and repented and confessed his sin of irreverence. And those pages are still held today you can see them in the Basilica of St. Rita in Castia. And um, in fact, to add miracle upon miracle, um, in the pages, you can see the face of a man. Um, in, in every year, that um, those pages are processed throughout um, on Corpus Christi Sunday, and they're processed um, during the Corpus Christi procession. And I'd like to add one more which is um, one of the most recent miracles that's in the exhibit. And it happened in 2001 in the Archdiocese of Trivandrum, India. It, it happened um, with a priest named Father Johnson Paror. He was um, having, they were gonna have Eucharistic adoration that parish um, on April 28th, 2001, had started a novenas to St. Jude. 
And when Father exposed the Blessed Sacrament in the monstrance, he noticed like three dots appearing on, on the host. And he called the faithful to look at this and um, he wondered about it. But when he reposed the, the, monst the host and he had to go out of town. But when he got back on May 5th, he um, opened up the tabernacle and he saw in the host the face of a man. And he was, he was very moved and he knelt down to pray and he thought that only he could see it. But he asked the altar boy, what did he see? And the altar boy saw it. And then when he put the um, monstrance out, everyone could see it. And he, the priest started to cry. And um, they always chose a certain passage to um, read of scripture for the adoration time. And the priest had chosen, before he even knew this was going to happen, he had chosen the passage regarding doubting Thomas, who doubted and how Jesus asked um, him to put his hands into his wounds. And um, the Archbishop wrote about this miracle. And he said, if the Lord is speaking to us by giving us this sign, this most surely requires a response on our part. And I think that is what all the Eucharistic miracles require. They require a response. What are we gonna say to these miracles? Um, are we gonna give the Lord our love and our belief and our faith? How are we gonna respond? And I think that's a question for every Catholic. You know, it's so true. Uh, Thomas said, you know, I'll believe if I see but I like to flip that around and say, I'll see if I believe. And um, while you were talking, I, I was thinking of, I have been so blessed in my travels. Uh, in 1997, I was in Santarem, where Eucharistic Miracle is for the 750th anniversary. And they had this wow. Eucharistic procession with the Bishop and they had leaves and flowers on the roads uh, and the big canopy, you know, with the Eucharist. And it was, I, I still, it was incredible. And in my travels to Samoa, years ago, there were nine seminarians ready to be ordained. And the people said, we're going to have nine days of Eucharistic adoration, one each night for one of the future priests. And on one of the nights, there was a group of 50 people, maybe, and the archbishop was there under a tent, and they all saw Jesus crucified in the host. I mean, these things are happening all over the world. If you look and read the books, it's not just something happened once every five, 600 years. And um, would you please give your website again and uh, perhaps the uh, Eucharistic Congress website because people may be watching this in the Philippines, in India, in Africa, and I want them to be have access to the work you're doing because we have to get the truth out. The truth will set us free. Sure. Um, our website is rpamichigan.org. And the website for the Eucharistic Revival is eucharisticrevival.org. And again, Mark, as you said, if people want to help sponsor exhibits, maybe getting up to the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, um, this is the time to do it. People have the time to step up. Yeah, if you go to our website, there's an email that you can send me a send me an email. I'll get back to you soon and uh, let's talk, okay? Because um, we're in this for no other reason than we want people to believe in Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Only because if they do, their hearts and minds will be transformed. Their lives could be different. Your life is going to be so much more joyful, less stressful, full of peace. Isn't that what you, isn't that what people want? I would hope. And Jesus can make that happen, but you have to turn your whole heart over to him. It isn't going to happen if you just dip your toe in the water. It's going to probably require some changes. So I pray for you and, and for those hearing this. If you're in that midst of thinking right now, do I want to give my whole entire heart to Jesus? Do I really believe this Catholic thing that this is his body, blood, soul, and divinity that uh, you'd have the courage to make the changes necessary in your life. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me today on Mercy Unbound. May your work prosper and flourish in this, especially in this time of Eucharistic renewal. Um, and I'm thinking of the words of St. Louis Imard, uh, founder of the Blessed Sacrament Fathers, um, may thy Eucharistic kingdom come. Um, because... Uh, the same Jesus in the Eucharist is the same Jesus behind me in the image of divine mercy. So people, thank you. 
for watching this show. Uh, get a hold of uh, Mark and Margie, and uh, let's get the truth out because the truth will set us free. And as we know, God is light. Hatred cannot drive out hatred, only light can. Darkness cannot dark, uh, drive out darkness, only light can. And uh, thank you both again for joining me on Mercy Unbound, and God bless. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R, and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.